Well, good morning. No problem, brother. So we are going to be in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, this morning. But before I begin there, I just want to say this. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Is today not a gorgeous day? It is currently 82 degrees, sunny. It's going to be warmer today. It's June. I don't know if that's good or bad for the summer that comes, but it is a gorgeous day. It's a good day after church to be on the water. You know what I'm talking about? To be just by the shore of some moving water. I love to be parked next to a body of water. For some reason, it is the thing that makes me feel the closest that I feel to God. Not that God isn't everywhere and that he doesn't hear our prayers everywhere, because he does. But when I'm at the water, it just encourages me. It doesn't matter if I'm praying or if I'm reading. I like to swim. I like to stare into the distance. I like to consider. I like to fish. I enjoy fishing. I like lakes. I like rivers. I like streams. Water is good. And when we first moved to central New York a few years ago, I discovered quite quickly that though I had left the Thousand Islands region, there was still some nice water here. And that was a good thing. It was a really encouraging thing. But one of the pieces of advice that I got very early on was to not swim or fish in Onondaga Lake. <laughs> it's good advice. It's advice that I have listened to in my time here. You know, think about it. It's a hot day. On a day like today where it's 82 or even 90 is what it's projected to be, a cold glass of ice water, clean and pure, can be a very refreshing thing. I like water. Pastor Brandon likes water. We have a Brita filter in the kitchen because we drink a lot of water. We like cold water. But I'll tell you what, if you put just a few drops of motor oil in that water, it's not so appetizing anymore, is it? You see, just a little bit of contaminant, just a little bit of pollution makes it an undrinkable mess. You know, it's interesting. If you start with something pure and you add just a little bit of grime, it becomes undrinkable. But if you start with just a little bit of grime and add a whole ton, gallons and gallons of water, you still don't really want to drink it. There's something about pollution, substances that contaminate, things that make whatever they touch unclean and unsafe that makes us pause and recognize we don't want to ingest that. You know, the same concept is true in the moral realm as it is in the physical. One sinful act can ruin a perfect record of righteousness. And at the same time, it works the other way. A good deed, or even a dozen deeds, don't overcome and override a record of evil. And so the question becomes, how can one take a dirty life? How can one take a contaminated, polluted life and make it clean. And I'm going to give you just a hint. We're going to jump all the way to the end. This is the conclusion. We can't. We can't. Now, the world doesn't seem to understand this because there are all kinds of programs and products and offers that are made from alcoholism to internet addiction, from compulsive gambling to excessive shopping. There's counselors that are out there that try to help us to deal with our past hurts and to just understand that we need some help. There are pills, there are programs, there's an entire therapeutic industry that has grown up around this idea of people who are broken needing to be healed, people who have been defiled needing to be cleansed. And that's true, but God's Word says that those things aren't the ultimate solution. There may be value in some of those, there may be some use for some of that, but at the end of the day, Nothing can remove the stain of sin in our lives. Nothing can make us clean before God except for the work of Jesus Christ. And it's that concept, that idea, that informs and frames our understanding of Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 
through 11. I'm going to read that in just a moment, and then we'll dive into it. But first, allow me to pray for our time together. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love. Lord God, you have called us to be a holy people, a people for your own possession. And yet, as we read the scripture, as we look at today's passage, and frankly, as we look at our own lives, we recognize that we are not a holy people, at least not in our own strength. Or God, we miss the mark countless times, countless times a day, we fail to live according to your perfect standard. And so, Lord, we come as broken people seeking to be made new. Lord, we come as imperfect people seeking to be cleansed of unrighteousness. Father, help us to see in the words of Scripture, in the words of Haggai the prophet, the truth that points us toward the source of our cleansing. Help us to see the work of Christ on display, we pray. In Christ's holy name, amen. So as we begin in Haggai chapter 2, we start in verse 10. I'm going to read through verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean has contact with a dead body, touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. And Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before the stone was placed upon the stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the product of your toil with blight, and with mildew and hail, yet you did not turn from me. Turn to me, excuse me, declares the Lord. Consider this day onward, from the 24th day of the nine months, since the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. From this day on, I will bless you. Thanks be to God for his word. You know, as we look at this passage, I think it's important that we consider some aspects of the context, some of the dating because as we've mentioned before in the midst of this book, Haggai is really a unique book in that it continually, again and again and again, provides dates for when the events take place that it describes. Starting right in the very first verse of the first chapter, this, this section on judgment that comes due to delayed obedience or really disobedience, we see that it's mentioned that it's the second year in the reign of Darius the king. It's the sixth month. In the first day, that's what we see back in verse 1 of chapter 1. Now as we jump ahead a little bit, we go to verse 1, chapter 15, we see the people repent and begin to work on the temple. Again, it's the sixth month, now it's the 24th day. Jumping ahead to the passage uh, that we looked at last week, chapter 2, verse 1, this is the section in which God looks at the people and see, seeing what they had done, says, I am with you. He gives them his blessing, his presence. That takes place in the seventh month on the 21st day. And then as we come to our passage today and even our passage for next week, in chapter 2, three different times in verses 10, 18, and 20, 
we see this date mentioned, the ninth month in the 24th day. Now, if you don't know much about the Jewish calendar, when it's describing these things, the months themselves are actually lunar months. It's a little bit of a different kind of a ca uh, calendar than we have, but we can convert those dates to our uh, calendar, our Gregorian calendar that we use today, and it comes out pretty accurately that the first section of Scripture took place on August 29th, 520 B.C., give or take. Not an exact date, but we, we pin it around August 29th. And by the time the people repent and begin work, it's September 21st. Later, when God says that he is with them, it's October 17th. And now as we come to this last two sections of chapter 2, we see that both what we're going to look at today and what we're going to look at next week take place on the same day, and that's roughly December 18th, 520 B.C. Now, do those dates matter? Well, in some cases they may. As we saw last week, there was some relationship between the dates and the festivals of Israel. But what we're going to look at today isn't a special day, per se, but it does tell us that from the moment that Haggai first spoke on behalf of the Lord and called people to repentance, delivering a message of judgment, to where we end up now, it's been roughly four months. Time has passed. The people have counted the cost of following the Lord. They have chosen time and again to repent and believe and to live out their belief through obedience. And that's important. It's important to understand that this is the process. This isn't just a one-time things get declared and then everything's perfect from there. No, this is an ongoing process conforming to the will of God as the people of God grow in holiness and are sanctified by the work of the Lord in their midst. It takes time to grow in God. God is at work in the lives of His people. And we see this morning that Haggai is approaching the priests specifically to ask some questions. He's going to the spiritual leaders of Israel to talk about the nature of the law and then ultimately to make some applications to the people. Next week, he's going to not talk to the priests, but rather to the rulers and the authorities. And we've seen previously in the book that he's talked to both of these groups and even the remnant of the people, the people of Israel themselves who were faithful and followed the Lord, which also meant that there were some people in Israel who were not faithful and didn't follow the Lord because these remnant were separated. They were identified separately as a part of God's people. Now, as we come to verse 12, we see that the dialogue back and forth between Haggai and the priests, again, is about some questions in the law. He's asking these questions, hoping to come to an agreement on the logic about the law, the ways that it makes sense and how it applies, so that he can then tie it to the people. Well, this is what he says in verse 12. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and touches with this fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? In other words, if someone has this consecrated meat, this meat that has been set apart in the midst of the temple, used as a free will offering, if they take this meat home in their pocket, which is what the fold was, it was the equivalent of a pocket, if they take the meat home so that they can eat it, and in the process it touches other food, does that holy or sacred meat convey the holiness to whatever it touches? And the answer is no. It doesn't. That holiness doesn't transfer. That meat has been set apart. The people are able to take it home, but it has to be either eaten or consumed by fire by the end of the second day. So they can take it home, but it can't sit in the fridge like the pork chops I found last week. <laughs> It has to be eaten within the first two days if it's this free will offering. And so it, it's set apart. It's special. There's rules to it. There's rules because holiness matters. And to allow it to degrade would be antithetical to the way that God works and the way that He desires for His people to live. So Haggai asked, suppose it comes in contact with other food. Is it going to transfer this holy status? And of course, the Priests gave a pretty straightforward answer. No. That's not how that works. Then he decided to go a little bit of a different way. He talks to the priests 
And he says, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? Now, you have to understand that in Old Testament Israel, under the law of Moses, to be in contact with a dead body meant that you were defiled because a dead body was unclean ceremonially. And to have that uncleanliness on you, to have that ceremonial uncleanliness meant that anything you touch would be defiled. It's not that you were bad. It's not that you were wrong. But the way that God had set things up was that there were certain rites and rituals that had to be followed, certain levels of holiness. And so the question is, if someone who had touched a dead body was defiled and touched the meat, the holy meat that had been set apart, would that then be defiled? The priests were pretty adamant. Yeah, I mean, that's how that works. That's exactly the point. And Haggai agreed with the priest's assessment. They had a right understanding of how this was supposed to work. And so what he did is in verse 14, he continues to use that logic and he applies it to the people of Israel, the people to whom he ultimately has been prophesying here. Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. The fact that he had just mentioned contact with the dead body and then applies that, that, that defilement to the people, he says basically that everything the people of God did was tainted by their sin. There's a twofold implication that Haggai's trying to draw for the people of God in this. First, their sin had caused them to be spiritually dead and to defile everything that they did. And second, because they're dead, there's no amount of activity on their part that would profit them until they had repented of their sin. In other words, if you're dead in sins and trespasses, there's nothing you can do to bring yourself back to life. These concepts were clearly applied by Haggai to the people. He was getting after the fact that their sin had separated them from God and caused them to be spiritually unclean. But that isn't just an application that Haggai makes for Israel in his own day. This is something that applies to you and to me as well. We see it very clearly in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is what we read. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The implication is just as clear here as it was in Haggai's text. Our sin separates us from God and causes us to be spiritually dead. And this is true for every man, woman, and child. You see, apart from the work of Christ in our lives, Apart from the unmerited favor, the grace of God, we are dead, slaves to sin, children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. This is because every one of us has inherited through the line of Adam the sin that leads to death. This sin nature in our lives comes from our first father. We are born unclean, slaves to this nature. And as Haggai said, every work of our hands is unclean. Everything that we do, we defile everything that we touch apart from the work of Christ. I know that that can be a hard saying, that can be a hard thing to hear, but I think, honestly, that while some people deny this and they deceive themselves and they believe this idea that humans are a big deal, I think most people understand that there is some sense in which Humans have been marred, that our consciences have been seared, that we are not inherently good. But too often, those who recognize that we aren't perfect try to then perfect themselves. They take the fact that they fail each and every day and they just try to work harder, to do better, to work for their justification. We think that if we can turn to rituals or good works or self-help, that if we just do enough, that it will balance out in the end. 
But that's like trying to take a glass full of motor oil and add a few drops of water and think it's clean. It doesn't work that way. It'll never work that way. And since every work of our hands is unclean, the way that Haggai says, no amount of effort on our part can improve our condition. What we do is not going to make things better. But Ephesians 2 doesn't stop in verse 3, even though that's where I stopped reading. See, Ephesians 2 continues on in verse 4. It says, But, however, God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In other words, not because of what you've done. By mercy, by the unmerited favor of God, you have been saved. In verse 6, he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And in case we missed it, verses 8 and 9, just they bring it home. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The only work that we boast in is the work of Christ. His perfect life. His atoning death on the cross. And His resurrection from the dead, bringing us the hope of new life, is the only work that we can boast in. And we didn't do it. He did. The only way to be saved is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The call of Christ is to consider your ways to repent and believe. And really, that's what we see throughout the rest of this passage. Now, verses 15 through 19, really, just they all flow together. And there's this command. Now then, consider. And we've seen that term already in this book. Consider your ways. Consider your ways again and again. Haggai, through the Lord speaking to him and having him speak to the people, have called them to consider their ways. And here he says, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? How did things go for you, in other words? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. And what's interesting is he's, he's describing the fact here that the people of God are not flourishing. We've talked about that a little bit, that delayed obedience or disobedience ultimately inhibits human flourishing. And God desires for his people to flourish, to be blessed by him in the midst of their obedience. But verse 17 explains why they're not flourishing. He says, I struck you and all of the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, the 24th day of the ninth month, since that day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. The judgment of God had been poured out on his people. He had not blessed the labor that they had done because their sin had separated them from him and caused them to be spiritually dead. And so Haggai's words of Condemnation and judgment are transitioning here. He's explaining why they're in the situation they're in, but he's also getting ready to offer them some encouragement, which, by the way, we'll see in more detail next week. So this moves from indictment to exhortation. The people in Haggai's day faced the consequences of their sin in a very visible way. The way that the Old Testament covenant had been set up, as we saw this morning in our call to confession, Deuteronomy 28 If you obey the commands that the Lord has given you, He'll bless you. That was what they had been called to. They could see, though, that God was not allowing them to flourish. And so Haggai reminds them, hey, you've got to look at your situation. You've got to consider your ways. You've got to understand the times and what you're dealing with. You see, under the terms of the covenant that God made with Moses, the consequences of disobedience would hit them most clearly in two ways. One, in military might, and two, in the agricultural bottom line. Now, this might not be super familiar to us today, but the way that Israel was 
in, in the world, the way that they understood their strength was if they could conquer people and if they could grow enough food to survive. That makes sense, right? And God's blessing, his promise back in Deuteronomy 28 was to give them strength and to give them the food they needed to bless the work of their hands if they obeyed the Lord. But he also promised serious consequences if they disobeyed. And by Haggai's time, the Israelites had experienced the consequences from a military perspective already. Jerusalem had fell, had fallen. They had been exiled. They had been taken to a faraway land. And all of that was exactly what the Lord said would happen way back in Deuteronomy 28. But now 70 years of exile had passed. The people had returned to their homeland, which is great, but they weren't seeing the flourishing, the agricultural blessing that they were hoping for. They were still experiencing the same old covenant curses in their endeavors. When they expected to find heaps of grain, they found only a little. And that's what the passage is talking about when it says you were expecting 20, you found 10, you were expecting 50, you only found 20. You worked really hard, but the things that you reaped just weren't what you wanted them to be. You labored in futility. That's what we see. A blight affected their vineyards. There was wasting away of all of the things that they were thinking God would bless. You see, the problem was they didn't see that they were actually experiencing judgment. We see that in the text. Verse 17. The Lord says, I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. And yet you did not turn to me. You see, that struggle, that futility that they were laboring, the hardship that they were enduring was meant to be a trigger that would cause them to go, we've got to turn back to God. We've got to seek what his will is in the midst of this situation. Is there something wrong in us? Because if there is, we need to repent of that and get right with him and walk according to the commands that he gave us in this covenant. But they didn't see it. They were blinded to the fact that their own sin had separated them from God, that their futility and the sickness that pervaded throughout their land was meant to be a trigger to give them hope, and instead it just drained them and sapped them of their faithfulness. I don't know about you. Maybe you haven't seen this in your own lives. But the last 20 years has been interesting in my mind. You see, trials and chaos on a personal level, on a national level, even on a global scale in more recent months are meant to cause us to look to the Creator. Natural disasters, personal struggles, all of these things have multiple purposes behind them, but one of them is to point us back to our God. And yet... They don't necessarily cause people to consider their ways. And I say that as one who doesn't always get the message myself. We want a solution for our pain. It's human nature. We're in discomfort. We want it fixed. But we're not always eager to find the solution to the sin problem that may be, may be behind our In salvation, it is never the case that God helps those who help themselves. That isn't the message. That is not a biblical concept. Salvation doesn't come from self-help. It doesn't come from our own good works. It doesn't come from how hard we try. It must come from something outside of ourselves. And we know as followers of Christ that salvation is of the Lord. To be more specific, as we saw in Ephesians 2, salvation is found in Christ alone in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. And as we look at verses 15 through 19, we recognize that this was God's way, his means of calling Israel to repentance. He wanted them to consider their ways, to recognize the division that had come between them and him, and to repent and believe, to follow the promise that they had been given, the covenant promise. But, And this is where it gets really interesting, at least to me. It wasn't just about external obedience. It wasn't just, hey, God says this, and so we do this. That's good. Obedience is good. Don't hear me saying that it's bad. 
But true obedience is not just external. It's not just going through the motions and checking the list. It's not just doing things out of duty. True obedience is from a heart, a heart of love and faith. And that's what Haggai is calling the people to, not just to rebuild the temple because they have to, but because they have a unique and special relationship with God, a covenant promise to which they have been bound. And it's meant to fuel them. It's meant to make them a people for his own possession. Sound familiar? Four months after the initial message of judgment, the people got the point. They had repented. The foundation had been laid. Things had been busy. And they had done so not just out of duty, but out of a transformed heart. And the way that the Lord addresses them at the end of verse 19 is fabulous. From this day on, I will bless you. Again, not just because they did what they were supposed to do, but ultimately because he, as a gracious God, as a giving, loving God, was forgiving them of their sins, showing them unmerited favor, and calling them his people once again. Brothers and sisters, we are not unlike Israel. We have great need in our day to consider our ways to look at our own hearts and to compare them to what we know to be true about our Lord and Savior. As if a global pandemic isn't enough of a sign for the people of God to take at least a moment to refocus our hearts and to look to Him, we are blessed as a people to have a regular means of grace, a regular reminder that's meant to call us to consider our ways. You know, we often say that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace for Christ's people. That's a a terminology that we use here. It means that it's one of the things that Christ has ordained for the people of God to be reminded of the gospel. Not that we forget here, but that often our hearts are prone to wander and to forget, even if we know the truth. Communion is meant to be an ordinance that brings our wandering hearts and minds back to a rightful focus on the gospel. It's a prompt ordained by God that we would consider our ways, that we would repent of sin, and that we would once again live in obedience to Christ, our Savior. And so as we come to the table, as we seek to practice communion, we recognize that this is a family meal, that if you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, if you have been baptized and associated yourself with the death and resurrection of Christ, then then you're welcome to partake. And the Lord's Supper involves two simple elements, a piece of bread and a cup of juice. And these represent the body of Christ, which was offered up on the cross for our sin, and the blood of Christ, which was spilled on our behalf to wash us clean as snow and to usher in the new covenant of grace, the new relationship that replaces the old completes the old is really a better way of putting that, that fulfills the old. You know, though these things are simple, bread and juice, they are also significant. Because the Lord's Supper is meant to cause us to consider our ways just as the people of Haggai's day were repeatedly commanded to do so. Consider these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 27 through 29 say this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That text sounds awfully prophetic, doesn't it? A lot like Haggai and the other prophets. That if we do this in an unworthy manner, without discerning the body, we eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. Why why do we need that warning? Well, I think in part it's because this ordinance, this means of grace, is meant to be something that we do on a regular basis. And there's some differing practices. Some people do it once a month. Others do it twice a month. We've been doing it uh, once a week for the last few months. I don't think that Scripture demands that we do it in a certain frequency. But I do think it demands that we don't do it by just going through the motions. That this doesn't become a ritual, a meaningless thing that we do to fill our time with. This 
is meant to symbolize the body and blood of our Savior. And there is nothing that should grab our attention more than Christ and His work. And so we come to the table and we recognize as a people that we are unclean. We are unworthy to partake of this. And yet, and yet, we also recognize the words of 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see the relationship between those things? We come unclean. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of that uncleanness. The beautiful exchange of faith is that Christ died. He took on our sin, became our sin, so that in Him we might become His righteousness. His perfect record is imputed to us. It's given to us. And so when the judge of all creation, when God looks at us, He sees Christ and His perfection, not our failings, not our mistakes, not our sin. If you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, you are justified, declared righteous before the Lord. And what an incredible promise that is. What an incredible gift that is. And it is a gift. Because again, it's not something we can earn. It is simply that which we receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so brothers and sisters, this morning, I would call on you to examine yourself the way that Scripture commands. Consider your ways. Seek the heart of the Lord and honestly consider, is there any unrepentant sin in you? Anything that you haven't confessed? Any conflicts between you and the Lord or you and another brother or sister? Confess your sins to Christ. Confess your sins in faith and receive His righteousness in exchange. That is the promise we have, the grace of God. In just a few moments, we're going to partake of this together. I would encourage you, take a moment, almost as if we were having yet another call to confession this morning. Because our assurance of pardon is the perfect work of Jesus, and we'll see that in just a moment. But take a moment to examine your hearts and to confess any sin to Christ that you have not done so. We'll be quiet and then we'll proceed together.